in numerator to make <coughs> the rate determining steps transition state. Does that make sense? All right, we're going to come, let's look at the denominator now, and then we're going to come back to this idea of what's in the, what, what may be adsorbs or desorbs. But let's look at the denominator first. Remember where this came from, right? So what is 1 over that denominator term? Anybody know? Yeah, exactly. It's the, the coverage. Notice this isn't squared now. This is the coverage, which we defined that last time, of vacancies. And that comes from the coverage is defined as the concentration of vacancies divided by the concentration of total sites. And then we do our site balance, and this is what you get. Okay. site balance, and then I can substitute in for all of these things, and you end up right here. Now what if I write instead of a 1 here, what if I put K1 PA? Now what is what coverage is it? It's coverage of A star. Sometimes you'll see people just put coverage of A. I don't know who's right. I always put A star. And I can do it for these others as well, right? I can do it for A, B, and C. So when you see these denominator terms, I didn't really leave myself a lot of room to write. What you want to think about is this is related to the concentration of empty sites. This is related to the concentration of A on the surface. B on the surface and C on the surface. So when I do a reaction, are all of those species on the surface? Yeah, I mean, that's the only way I can do the reaction, right? I've got to make A star, B star, and C star. So they all have some coverage. But are they all large enough to make a difference in my predicted rates? What if I have a system where the coverage of vacancies is 99.9999%? In other words, that's saying that 1 is much, much larger than K1 PA or K2 PB or K3. <coughs> the equilibrium constant for C adsorption times the pressure of C. So if this term dominates, what happens to my rate equation? How does it simplify itself? If the 1 is the dominant species in the denominator, then what happens to the rate equation? Hmm? Yeah, and remember that if I'm talking about an observed rate constant, I can't distinguish between these three values, right? Especially once this goes away. So I just get some rate constant times the pressure A times the pressure B. So that's if the surface is essentially bare during reaction. You know, there are a little bit of A and B and C, but they are minor species on the surface. They don't block sites. So the reaction doesn't really notice that they're there. Yeah. 
Now let's assume that instead of this term being dominant, let's assume that the surface is covered in A. And adsorb A. So now what happens to the rate? First, what happens to the denominator? Which term do I leave behind? A1, PA. Yeah, the one that is associated with A star. So this term goes away, this term goes away, this term goes away. Again, I'm going to get K observed. It's going to be a different K observed, of course. I have the pressure of A in the numerator, the pressure of B in the numerator. What's in the denominator? <coughs> yeah, well, let's say that the K1 ends up in here. So you get PA squared. Don't forget that. So if we simplify, we get K observed times the pressure of B, now divided by the pressure of A. So A is a reagent, and yet it inhibits the reaction. If I increase the amount of A in the system, the rate of my reaction goes down, not up even though it's one of my reactors. So if I have this, and I come back to this idea of what's in the numerator and what's in the denominator. So let's first take this example. So what's in the numerator, A and B? Again, that means that in order to make the transition state, I need to adsorb both A and B. What's in the denominator in that case? <coughs> there, is there a denominator? No, nothing. OK. So that means nothing desorbs. Nothing has to desorb is the way to think about it. Nothing has to desorb. And that's because the surface is essentially bare. So in order to make the transition state, I don't need to ask anything to leave. The surface has plenty of space. I just make the transition state. Now let's take this other example where we had R, K observed, pressure of B divided now by the pressure of A. So what's in the numerator? All right, so B adsorbs to make the transition state. And what's in the denominator? A, so A has to desorb. So let's see if this can sort of make sense with pictures, because you guys might be getting a little lost. That's OK. So if I have the surface, and here's my starting point, I'm covered in A. How many sites do I need to make my transition state? Two. So let's draw my transition state. And notice that I've got six A's, so now I'm going to still have six sites in this picture. So again, I'm trying to draw the same six sites. But now I've got this transition state, which occupies two sites on my catalyst surface. It's an interaction between B and A. Don't worry about the individual atoms, because these aren't real molecules. And I just put that symbol here. This double dagger just means transition state. So it's just as a further. OK, so what happened in between? What did I have to bring in from the gas, and what did I jettison to the gas? So something had to leave, and something had to come in. A left, because, again, my rate equation already told me I had to remove an A, and B comes in, right? So if this is the picture, if my surface is covered in A, and I have a transition state that involves something that comes from B, something that comes from A, then this is my rate equation. So already I've learned a lot about the mechanism. I've learned that this is a bimolecular reaction of A and B making C. Now, of course, in this very simplified case, that's pretty obvious. It's, there's only one surface reaction that I wrote down. But in real systems, there would be 30 or 40 different surface reactions. 
And that's for a simple system. So which of those is rate determining? I can already learn a lot by doing some kinetics. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, let's look at it. So what is a surface covered in C look like? My transition state doesn't change. So now I've got six C's on the surface. And I'm making a transition state that takes two sites. So I still have four C's. And then in the middle now, again, I have that same transition state. So what came in, or what left? Two C's. Not one, but two. What comes in? A and B. So what is our observed rate? What's in the numerator? A and B. What's in the denominator? C squared. Notice, I've erased it, but notice you would get the same thing if you go back to the full big rate equation and you sort of remove everything from the no denominator except C. It's going to give you that same exact expression. I just want you to be able to think about what do these expressions mean in terms of the physical processes that have to happen in the mechanism. Yeah? Yeah, we assumed that this was irreversible. But in the, when we drew it up, it was reversible. Right? We started that, but by the time we had derived our rate equation, I wrote up there, ah, here it is. <laughs> Look at that, my laziness saved me. <laughs> Otherwise, the rate equation would include reverse reactions, and it would look different, and, and these assumptions would be different, yes. But most of the time, most of the time, um, the rate determining step is an irreversible reaction. Yes? How come both A and B, so <coughs> the atom binds to the surface of the catalyst? Yeah. Like, why couldn't A be bound to the surface of the catalyst? 